Hey, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you today. It's February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day to all of you and what this wonderful Valentine's will be for many of us. I'm sure we want to wrap up this call soon so we can go out and buy those roses that we all forgot to buy. I said for you, Matt, just... you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> you guys have Valentine's Day? Uh, we we just, uh, we you know, we tackle a kangaroo and punch each other. Oh, uh, yeah, we have Valentine's Day. <laughs> That's I figured that's what you did. Just run around and tackle <laughs> bigger rooms and punch each other. That's wonderful. Um, yeah, it's always like uh, I, I, this is where you see the roses out on the street corners, just people selling roses like crazy, you know, doing what they need to do. Yeah. Um, let's do this. Let's uh, let's begin the conversation in a different way. This is the weekly briefing. We're the one time of week that we gather together some of the thoughts that we hear and can see happening. I'm going to admit I'm a little bit selfish on this topic today because I am processing what this means to be a business owner who wants to sell or exit, um, has to kind of think differently about the process because in about one month from today, we're going to have a Palm Springs conference with myself, David C. Baker and Blair Enns discussing exactly exit and exit strategy. And I find that I'm often ahead of the curve and talking about something that business owners aren't quite ready to agree with. So what I end up doing is throwing something out there and then waiting for people to to know that it's safe to talk about it and willing to kind of catch up and, and do that. And when it comes to exit planning, my theory is, is that there was a big 2006 boom of production companies, 2006, 2007, 2008, and we're approaching the 18th, 9th, you know, 17th and 16th year of that business ownership. And as we approach 20 years of business, many of us get kind of asking different questions, especially when there's a disruption like we felt last year and we're feeling this year, wondering, do I have enough energy to put it together again and want to go you know, reinvent or repurpose or, or grow or pivot? And uh, the thought process is, where, well, what else is there to your business? Can Is there an asset, an ability? And talking about that in exit strategy or today about why people want, would want to buy a business, you can understand a value proposition very different than just owning your business and using it as your like cash flow system. And Matt, that was you. How many years of business did you were you into before you sold Explainers? So I had I had run one studio for um, thirteen years, and then I um, I separated from my business partner and started another studio called Explainers, and ran that for four years, and then um, sold it to Deloitte. And the funny thing was when I started it because I thought the first one was like a a creative studio where it's all about trying to do cool character stuff, and the second one was more about working direct to client and more of a business proposition when it's when i started it um i said oh you know i want to grow this business and sell it in three years but then never had any idea how you actually did that it just sounded like a cool thing to say and um and then um and then funny enough it ended up happening but i guess um when like when it actually so i i hadn't actually planned for it i hadn't gone out looking but then i started working i i had lunch with someone and they said, um, I love working with you. I'm going to write five emails. And lots of people say, I'm going to write emails. But he wrote really good ones. And he wrote five emails to five people that were relevant and said, you do this. Matt's company does this. You should meet. And one of them went to someone at Deloitte. And that person passed it on to their boss. And that boss then rang me. And we did a job. And then he said, we should uh, find a new way of working together. And I was like, well, you know, you just give me work and I'll do it. Yeah, right. And then he went, well, no, no, I want to buy you. And I was like, oh. And that's yeah. when I kind of like, you know, it hit me like, oh, wow. Like this, I had this sense that he was going to say that because of the way he was phrasing it. So I knew that something was up. But then once he said it, it was like, wow, you know, this is something I've, I've pondered for a long time, but never, uh, but now it's happening. And and what does this even mean? So and I guess when up. you started. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. yeah. I was going to say, this well, is yeah, back they, up just a second because you started the business to sell it or you just kind of knew... You had already, because you exited one business, you already had a sense that your entire life is not buried into just one brand or one business. You were you were willing to have an open mind to something new. Yeah, I guess because I'd, I'd been through that that separation from the first business. Because I guess 
the problem with I, I think the reason that some people don't even like they like the idea of talk about exit strategy but they don't think about it is you're very attached to your business so talking about leaving it is a bit like talking about death or dying you know like it's like it's just something mortality is something that's depressing to think about or it's too big oh. to think about so you don't want to think about it um but because i'd sort of been through a, a mini death by separating with my old business um I, I and this new business just seemed more like a it seemed more businessy it seemed more like something that people would you know i was working yeah. more closely with businesses it seemed like something that people might want to buy yeah so transactionally like you were you went into the intention of knowing the transactional element of what yeah. the business was doing and how specifically that business brought value to your clients so clearly you the proposition of what the explainers was about and then what it could do for others had that ability to let somebody else own it. Um, yeah. So that, I just want to go back to something else you said, because I think this is exactly some of the focus I'm working through with uh, business owners I'm talking to, is that the, the time that they know it's, often the time that people come to me and talk about exiting, it, it's three to five years too late. Or, or I yeah. say this, like they're, I find that they regret the last three to five years because they didn't prepare for it and position themselves for a, a possible exit. <clears throat> and I, if I categorize what they didn't do is they didn't, they didn't recognize the asset they were sitting on. They, exactly. they loved their job and they used the ownership of their company to keep gaining permission to do the work they love to do. So they were using their their company as a vehicle to gain access to projects, to clients, and to grow. And I and maybe like in the fame field, they'd be more known and well known for what you're doing. But the idea that this company they had has an asset quality to it that could allow them to exchange it differently, sell it. In some cases, right now I'm coaching a company to actually merge where they would, their exit strategy is to buy another business. So to acquire yeah. your way out of an exit sounds different than most people think, but because of the capabilities that they have and clients that they use, an acquisition of someone else would double the income, double the revenue, and then boom, a totally new proposition of someone who can run their business and, and grow and expand. And so, I, I think what you just said about underestimating the value of what you've got is pretty important because i mean i totally even underestimated the value of my the company i split away from because i thought oh my god this business is doomed my my business partner and i are, are a train wreck um it just just take that thing out the back and set it on fire but then the fact that someone else was actually interested in buying that one and absorbing it and, and the fact that it then ran for another 10 years without either of us involved in it really made me sit back and go oh wow i i totally undervalued what that was and I couldn't even see other manifestations of what it might be without me being involved. I think that's why I asked the question in the title today the way I did is, I didn't ask the question, why would you sell your business? I was asking the question, why someone else might be interested in your business? Why a big business would buy a small business? What, what makes mm -hmm. your business interesting? And it's to almost get out of your own head, right? To get out of what you think it's worth because of what you what you wanted it to do and what it's not doing or what it is doing, but what someone yeah. else could do with it might be very different than that proposition. But does that scare you as a business owner? And maybe the us to the larger group, is that scary to think that someone would take over your business and do something different than what you wanted it to do or what you've been doing? Does it, you know, I wonder if it feels like I'm giving up, I don't know, legacy or purpose, or I don't know, changing my child's first name or something like that. Is, is there something in that connectivity we have that's holding us back and, and, and missing the mark? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ego involved in running a business. Like it, it's pretty ingrained in your identity. It's, it's, you know, for quite a few periods, it's all you think about and it's all you, it's who you are. So, but yeah, that other person who's gonna buy your business isn't you. And, um, and I think, as soon as you mention to someone you're selling a business, everyone just stands around and claps and throws confetti at you and treats you like you're very clever. But no one around you would really point out um, what the other person is thinking or what they're going to get out of it. It's just like, oh my gosh, you're obviously going to make, I think someone said to me, you're going to make so much money. You can buy one sports car and another sports car and just drive them into each other. And um, 
<laughs> that was not true. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. After Texas, it's not as the, the dreamy as you want it to be, is it? Yeah, yeah. You got a steering wheel. Let me. Um, <laughs> right. A really nice steering wheel. Um, yeah. I'll give you another yeah, but right. Because another uh, thing that I feel like holds me back from wanting to sell my small business is this thought process of, yeah, but Matt, I didn't get into this business to make money. I didn't get into this business to, you know, to have a something I trade. I I wanted to own a business to control the decision making and do the creative projects I wanted to. And aren't I just leaving that behind when I sell my business? I I can't fulfill that desire anymore. True, I mean, and, and I've read an interesting fact that the uh, quite a, like a high proportion of um, businesses sold come as a result of a lease like for me it was the lease that said it like I, I had this amazing lease I was renting this place in Darlinghurst I had the best rent I was ever going to get and I knew how my entire business functioned around that rent and then when I looked around at what rent was going to cost somewhere else it's like oh my gosh everything's going to change and I've been trying to increase my business to accommodate you know make more money but to move to bigger premises and to take it up to the next level is going to be this huge thing which I'm not sure I can do and um yeah that's I took the that three to five years too late problem isn't it where yeah now i wish i would have thought differently about what my business is or what my business does three years ago because when i when the when what's making the decisions for me is my lease then i then i'm not in control of that decision point um mm. you could there are other factors, a key employee leaving uh, a, a sales person or a sales representation changing these are some things that decisions thrust upon us and we don't really love it. Even just losing a big client, a big gorilla client forces you to do something different and react and you slowly fall apart as a business. It starts to unwind itself if you can't put it back under control and therefore the exit's a reaction instead of a proactive way of, of looking at it. Um, yeah. I was thinking more too of like, you know, your the understanding of influence over projects doesn't have to go away when you are working with another entity that's acquiring you. That's one one way of thinking of it. There are, you, you know, there's a lot of people that might be interested. There's not just one. And if one of the things that you're talking about is maybe continuing the service that you're doing, but getting exposure to another client base that an outside partner is going to come in and, and help you build. So they're expanding their their base of, of um capabilities and you're the you're going to be the specialist there um i i like to put people in this idea of like yeah but after the acquisition you can become the ambassador of the thing you do yeah right you don't yeah. have to own it to be the ambassador of it. you just represent that that part of the business and the work it does and that entity could still grow still grow under your influence but ownership or partial ownership doesn't necessarily remove your ability or desire to keep on going and you, hopefully you're choosing the right partner in that transaction that that person does help you support and grow and build and believes in you, not not to throw you out. Now that you're out, now that I bought you, Matt, please leave the back door. I'm going to do this myself. Know that person wanted to keep on going. And I think that was your relationship with Deloitte. Deloitte says, we're going to acquire you, but Matt, stay on and keep on doing what you do. We'd love to help it, um, help other people do what you do. And we're acquiring you for that purpose. Oh yeah, no, I, I really felt that um, yeah, I had to then find my value uh, as an individual as much as you do as a business. And then you get this opportunity to, to magnify certain aspects of what your value is. Um, it's probably not going to be drawing things, but it will be other aspects of what you bring. And and then understanding what's the value of, of creativity within other businesses and what what can you offer? I think like when they brought us in there, there was this, you know, it's 2016, design thinking was very big and people had this idea that, you know, melding creative minds and analytical minds together would produce amazing results. And sometimes it did, but it was also a lot of education process. I'm going to bring in Seth here. Seth has yep. some background on this. Hey, guys. Hey, Seth. Hey, Seth. Hey. Um, yeah, no, I just hate couldn't stay stay quiet. So I actually spent about six months 
consulting with a Stagwell agency on mergers and acquisitions. My responsibility was strictly like evaluate the struct, the organizational structures of like creative operations and do basically due diligence. Mm. So this was a hundred million dollars. This is like one of their agencies. Okay. So one of the agencies under Stagwell is a PR agency, about a hundred million dollar um, business. And they, for whatever reason, yeah, they weren't looking to acquire like huge businesses. You know what I mean? They had like a $5 million cap. Uh, but it was really interesting on like why they wanted to, right? So this was because it was a complimentary service. So it was a PR agency that had an appetite to get more creative work, right? They were, they're like a corporate community. They're like the, you know, PR agency of record for like Toyota and like, right? Corporate communications. And they were getting these briefs that were coming in and they just could not win them. Right. They could not win the integrated campaign work because they didn't have the creative capabilities. So what I helped them with was identifying like various different prospects. And they since they were a global organization, I actually did this on a global level. And it was really interesting to see like other studios and creative outlets or outfits in like Malaysia and like the fill like it was it was very interesting. So anyway, so yeah. I was going to say, Seth, Seth, if you're in the position you're in, you were looking under the hood of other agents, other creative agencies that were looking to be acquired. Would you, could you identify with the idea of many of those companies regretting the last three years and not preparing it? Because now you're coming in and thinking, wow, if you guys would have just done this for a couple of years, we would have, we would e more easily acquire you or you would make more money in that acquisition. Were you recognizing that in your analysis? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. These firms, though, were because like they would actually have like just so I in this situation, there was a, a complete like uh, presentation that was so I would go in there and they would give me a presentation. They would break down their org structure, right? They would show like showcase like uh, key, uh, key clients on their roster yeah. and uh, and then they would talk revenue, like where it was coming from. And these presentations were actually pretty dialed in, like in this, in the, this was just like, and honestly, this was like my own, this was one of, this was just like kind of random, you know, like I was doing some consulting with them on some other stuff and they're like, wait, you have this expertise in creative operations. Like, why don't we, you help out with, you know, help out with this because we're looking to kind of expand our creative capabilities. So if you can kind of review these firms. So these yeah. firms were pretty dialed. This one particular firm in Malaysia was very, they had an entire presentation. So they, yes, they were very much prepared yeah. and they were looking to sell. Now, some of the other firms, completely opposite side of the spectrum where I was going out, firms that I knew like here in LA, small shops, I would go and I would talk to the owner. They had no, there was nothing. Yeah. And you know what I mean? It was just like, hey, listen, I see what you guys are doing. I mean, the work is great. Tell me a little bit more about the, you know, structure. And if you're interested, I kind of had to take it up to the next level, you know, like, yeah. Um, but, but I like how you, I like the point you're bringing into this conversation is the thought process. And Matt, I think you were, you were probably recognizing this too. It's like the ability to expand the cap one business's ability to expand their capability through acquisition is a necessity for, for growth. And they can either do it organically or they can infuse it by doing an acquisition. And I think when uh, it yeah, came but... to your, your purpose there, someone said, I like what you're doing. I like your client base. Let's acquire you. It would sure save us a lot of headache trying to build it from scratch. Oh, it's like getting all the Pokemons in one basket. I mean, yeah, if you're paying like 10 to 15 grand to a recruiter to, to find all these specialist people, you're saving yourself 150 grand straight away. And you're getting a bunch of people that already know and like each other and work together well. Um, Seth, how long did an acquisition take, like when they acquired someone? Because I think some people underestimate how long that process is. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't involved at that. I was involved in that very finite lane of like evaluating the, the, their organization, the, the creative operations and doing that part of the due diligence. And then like once I would say, yeah, I think this is a good opportunity, then they would move up to like, 
right. you know, the next level. And then, cause I was reporting directly to the, like the chairman of the agency. So and then he would go in so that I wasn't, but my understanding was, yeah, it was like about a six month process. It could, could mm. potentially be longer. They could, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's like, that's what they, you're, you're definitely spot on in the sense that like, they're doing it. A lot of these acquisitions from my understanding are like, because the costs of like HR, like one, they're doing it for the expertise. They want to acquire the expertise, but then the cost to go hire and find these people is, you know, sometimes going to be more expensive and right. And then them to actually just go and buy, um, you know, purchase the business. But I actually have a question for you guys, because I, and this might be on, this is was was on my mind and maybe it might be on something some other folks mind as well so one of the reasons i mean i ran a studio for about 10 years and there was multiple opportunities for acquisitions right like we were pretty regularly getting contacted and i, I never sold the business um, but one of the reasons why i didn't and just you know straight full transparency was the business had debt can you do you guys have experience with this can you because if there might be some other folks here who might say wait i'm not ready to sell my business because you know and i never really like explored it any deeper i just said i can't sell my business because i had it wasn't even that much debt now that i think about it you know what yeah, i mean yeah but like and it was always something on my mind and i was like wait then the valuation isn't gonna and yeah. i would just so when people would contact me I'd be like i'm not ready i'm not ready eventually i was never ready and then it, you know what I mean? And now I look back, I'm like, there were so many times where I should have sold the business and I could have, but I was, you know, stuck on 150 grand of debt I had or something like that. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. it's a, there is a kind of, so it, I think even in answering Matt's question too, the two play each other out, right? So the, the timeline I often give people is expected to be a five-year process. And now what I mean by that is sometimes the person is ready to sell this year and they might be buy, find a buyer this year and then they have a two year earnout. So that some of that five year is that in the year you sell and then your earnout for two years. So that's three of the five years. Mm -hmm. But the company who's buying you wants to look back. They wanna look back two years or three years. So you can even expect a seven year timeline, the last three years, a year to sell your business because it, it does take a lot of courting a lot of presentations, some clarity of what your value proposition is, and then a three-year earnout. So just know that like from beginning to end, the scope at where they're looking at could be between five and seven years very easily. And then Seth, to your point, it's in the last two or three years, if you didn't wipe out that debt, when the time comes, the valuation or the earnout period is totally different. Um, you're, this is what that yeah. person is trying to buy, right? Um, what they're trying to buy is a guarantee of something. Otherwise, why would they give you cash or give you an upside of a business if there's not there's no there there? So if the my idea to buy you is for cash flow reasons and you prove that you go into debt every year, there's no uh, there's no there's nothing to buy. I don't I don't gain any cash from buying you. I'm buying I'm, you've proven that when you ran the business, it's only going to go into debt. So I might know how to get you out of debt, but that's my gains, not yours. So when I buy your business, I'm not going to give you my upside. That's why I'm buying you buy low, sell high. I'm giving you what you deserve from when you run the business. And I think that could be shocking for some people that they thought like, well, yeah, but it was a COVID year or the debt was it's liquid debt or it's a necessity to run in live action. Okay, cool. You're, you're just showing more risk factor that makes me have to, work differently with you and changes the valuation. So I, I think that's part of the, the proposition is knowing what someone's looking for. Now, if they're trying to gain capabilities and the debt actually just gives them a little bit of a discount, that's possibly negotiable. But in the valuation process, they're definitely talking about like, how, what's your ability? And specifically, what is your percentage on net or, or your net gain on the gross value? And can I guarantee it? There's some companies I work with, we work very, very hard to keep a 20% net profit year after year. Those companies are ready to sell at any moment because if I have a five-year track record of net profit, 20% net profit year over year, 
and a company, if a, a acquirer came today and looked at that business, they'd go like, oh, I'm buying it. Why? Because I get 20%. I get 20% of the gross from, the, from day one. So I'll get you to the other side of that. And then we'll, we'll push uh, very easily. And in a funny way, your net is what gonna, what's going to finance their deal for them. But if you're at zero, they don't have any cash flow to work with. And that could be very tricky. I'm getting into too many details, but that's two of the reasons why companies big companies want to buy small companies is for your cash flow. So with a cash flow proposition, then we have to be, we have to manage our cash flow. It could be for, for the purpose of capabilities. Okay, great. You're in motion graphics and I'm in live action. Hey, we could make an agency fulfill more capabilities. And I think that's what you guys are hitting on to. Um, but there are other, other bigger reasons why people are looking to acquire as well. And some of it is their own portfolio. Colin, you asked a question. Yeah. Thanks, Seth. I'm going to take uh, push you off and then uh, ask Colin asked yeah. a question earlier. Colin, you want to unmute and ask it? Yeah, I mean, I just want, like, you kind of just answered it there a little bit that it's not so much about headcount or gross and more about net profit, you know? I, well, I mean, I, I often wonder, well, could I, I sell my business? I, I 20 would be a terrible year for me. I'd run at 35% minimum profit. Yeah, I mean, when, when I would... When I was yeah. wandering around in the abyss, wondering why the hell people buy businesses, someone set me up with a, a friend of theirs in advertising in New York. And he just said, well, they buy them for three reasons. It's either acquire more headcount, acquire more services, or enhance and augment an existing small business. Yeah. And that's so it. Actually, but then on top of that, they also want to make money. I guess that's the fourth reason. It's like, it's not some charity for little creative unicorns. Fundamentally, they see you as a, as a, a proposition. It was interesting being at Deloitte when they went through acquisition season there was one year they went we've had a good year let's go shopping and they were like yeah you know business about one and a half million two million turnover with 10 people we can you know if that doesn't work we can write it off in two years it doesn't matter like you yeah. kind of when people have that thinking of what it's like to be part of a company with hundreds of millions of dollars where they could just splash out in something and they're part accountancy anyway so they know how to write it off um Matt, yeah, you it's actually, just, yeah, you, have, you make two good points there. One, Colin, the, the answer to your first question is head, head count can make a difference. So I like, I, I only know it from the outside point of view, but when I see some of the acquisitions taking place today, I see large, huge agencies who just need more creative bodies. And how else are they going to get that amazing creative director that already owns their business? They acquire that business to get that creative director and their team into their capabilities. That is a very, very big deal. Um, some of the work that I was doing the last couple of years with in the crypto space, the acquisitions were all about that. Hey, we need your programming talent and creative talent. We'll worry about the cash flow later. We, they have a business plan for that. So sometimes it's not just the number of bodies, but who those bodies are. So if I wanted Colin to work for me, a headhunter is not going to get Colin to get there. I'm going to acquire you to bring you in. Uh, that is a very, very likely need because I need your, it's not, and you're in the same capability as me, let's say. I just need your expertise so I can grow my business. That is one. So so to get the visibility to for somebody to find you, you have to kind of be out on that market, right? You do, you, there is a marketplace for it. I see Seth is posting, we are Barney. That's one of the, the companies I know that have called me directly and saying, hey, we, we can use your expertise into this conversation. Would you mind joining and being part of it? Um, also, David Baker's company, Punctuation, is one that um, that is, they're in M&A as two. And what you do is you you kind of work through these agencies to help get your act together. They help you put the numbers in place and give you a sense of valuation and what they're gonna shop you at. And it, if you've ever bought and sold a house, it feels like that. It feels like there's a, there's a rep who's telling you what it's worth and will help you market it for that. But then, then it's buyers, like you are talking through buyers and each buyer is gonna have a different reason and different proposals they're gonna get you. And these outside experts can help you navigate some of that, but the decision's always yours. Um, what I hate is when people are making decisions out of regret. I just don't want people to say, I, I was going to be out of business anyway, so I sold at $200,000. And, and therefore, and then I got stuck in a two-year earnout that was totally bogus. I should have just quit or something like that. Those are the worst situations to be in, but because many of us already have an existing client roster and people roster, there's already value in our business. We just have to find the buyers and position ourselves in front of those buyers. Yeah. Mm. 
there's a there's a what's lot the of multiple people. usually on on like production well, companies and yeah that's no i'll let me uh let me uh, let me re-ask the question so people understand what you mean by multiple um often when you sell a business people want to give you a multiple of your revenue or multiple of your profit so when they buy you they say hey if you're a one million dollar business i will give you two x so two times that so you're worth two million dollars Technically speaking, I think a $1 million business gets $1 million. It's not, it's not, it might be 1X or 0.8 or something like that. But it's, but businesses that are, have larger revenue are harder to come by. So if I wanted to get to $100 million in revenue, I don't want to buy 100 $1 million businesses to get there. I want to buy five $20 million businesses to make $100 million in revenue. Well, how many $20 million businesses are out there? So you're more of a unicorn the larger your, revenue stream is, and therefore the multiplier might be different. So at 20 million, you might get four times your revenue. So you're getting $80 million for your $20 million business, and you're getting one X or one time your revenue, a million dollars for your million dollar business. That's the what you're working against. And then there's this thing called a roll-up strategy where people are actually buying small businesses to bring them together. So I'll take four businesses at $2 million, I'll make it an $8 million entity. Now when I'm acquired, that $8 million entity is getting 3x instead of 1x that everyone we got separately. So we all gather together and we all gain in the process. But that gathering is a little bit tricky. That role can be tricky, can lead to some regrets because there's transitions within it. And you have to perform within whatever the roll-up strategy is. So Sometimes I find these roll-up strategies come together and fall apart very fast because they're held together so so loosely. But there are also great, great reasons to process some of that roll-up. Maybe some of you have been hit up by roll-up groups and uh, believed in that process, even tried some of it uh, to see what's there. But there are some technical things happening in that process because of the multiplier. That's a good question, Colin, thanks. Hopefully I answered it too. There's a lot to this process. Um, there's a lot in even just the desire to want to be part of a roll-up group. Um, and then or a roll-up group or an acquisition group and want to know that's the, you know, a worthwhile process. I think Matt, from you, the, the you know, what you kind of learned along the way is not just the acquisition itself and the value, but what it's like to be on the other side. And mm. I like to encourage people to also prepare for the seasons of that come to their side, because you will feel grief. You will feel like the loss of something. And I've had many business owners say the day after I sold was the worst day of my life because they almost felt like their identity walked away from them. So you have to be prepared for that process as well. That's why, again, like I like to use this ambassador metaphor of like, Hey, if you're, you're graduating to ambassador, you're not as afraid as if you, if you thought yourself as a business owner and that was taken away from you. So we want to work yeah. with people earlier, shift their mindset and start growing about what's possible. And everyone's exit is uniquely theirs because of your reaction in that moment. Uh, desperation, again, if we can avoid desperation, we want to push that away so we don't have to get forced into that and therefore feel some of the, the downside of a transition. Um, I think that's another weekly briefing topic right there. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> we can keep on going. <laughs> this is why it's eight hours in Palm Springs, right? We're going to kind of talk through and process some of this stuff. But it is on a lot of our minds. I know it. There's a lot that we've invested in our companies and we want to know, hey, Tim, what is possible? What's going on? How do I get there? And even when you sign up with one of these brokers, what are they really saying? And is this a good deal? And to, and to have a sounding board to walk that process. I've done that with so many business owners, just so they know there's a companion with them, understand their value and understanding what their own personal dreams and desires are. Um, yeah. Because your business is only part of your career and your career is only part of your life. You have to be able to stack those together. All right, we're 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 running late. So I apologize for keeping you guys late. If you uh, want to continue this conversation, we can just start a thread in community and keep it going. There are more resources. Um, as you ask questions, you'll remind me that I have them. I'd be happy to throw those of links in there as well. Seth, thanks for participating. And Colin, thanks for jumping in, throwing those questions at us. Matt, thanks, guys. I like to say we exist. So you thrive in business, life, and career. I think we're showing that today, talking about this. So uh, thanks totally. for joining the conversation. There's life on the other side. Yeah, absolutely.
All right. We'll see you all in community. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week, if not sooner. See you guys. Goodbye.